Okay, apologies for the, the short delay. Just working on, on the computer. What we're going to consider today is an extension of what we were looking at the last day, looking at individual behaviour and how then can we merge it into sort of a, a view of economics. What are the assumptions we as economists make about individuals? What else do we look at? What else is important in how we analyse particular situations? And then whether that just applies to what we consider traditional economic areas, traditional areas for economics to explore, or whether economics can branch out into other parts of society. So a question that was asked by Ed Lazier in an article a number of years ago was, is economics the premier social science? So economics is clearly part of the school of social sciences, social, dealing with people, a science, just an organised body of knowledge. So as economics dealing with people and the body of knowledge, is it the premier social science? Where would it rank or class as opposed to philosophy, psychology, sociology and other social sciences? <clears throat> so first we look at sort of the differences between economics and those and then how economics maybe could extend into areas that would be traditionally the remit of those uh, subjects, those sciences. So the three factors that distinguish economics from the other social sciences are something that we've looked at before. The first distinguishing feature is the assumption of rationality, which simply entails some form of maximising behaviour, that you're maximising some magnitude. <coughs> then we look at, <coughs> excuse me, the importance of equilibrium. And then finally, in economics, there's a focus on efficiency. And we can explain in detail what we mean by each of those three elements. So Lazier laid out in his article on economic imperialism what he felt the three distinguishing features were rationality equilibrium efficiency so as he said last friday the starting point in any economic theory is that the individual or firm is maximizing something that's our basic our starting point initially we're not too concerned with what it is they're maximizing just that their preferences are consistent that whatever they set out to do whatever they want to do that the decisions fit in with that. So whether that is selfishness, as in the concept of... There should be plenty there. There's 90 even gone around. I don't see 90 here, is there? No, that was the answer to that. But. Um, so in the, con the um, situation of an individual, they're maximizing something. So whether that is selfishness, making themselves as well off as possible in material sense, or selflessness, doing as much for other people. Whatever that is, as long as they're consistent in that, we're not too concerned with what their preferences are. As we'll see as we work through it, we can, in a sense, look at differences in preferences. So the starting point of our rationality assumption is that people usually maximise something. So for consumers, we assume they maximise utility, be that satisfaction, well-being, enjoyment, however you want to define it. And for firms, we assume they simply maximise profit. And the one advantage with profit is that we have a, a measurable uh, magnitude in money, that our euro's worth of profit is the same across all individuals. So when it comes to profit, we can measure it. With utility, it's not quite as straightforward. We don't have something that allows us to make interpersonal comparisons. Does one person get more enjoyment out of one product than another person. Very hard to tell. Whereas with firms, we can measure, does one firm make more profit than another? We can measure that with money. So sometimes results are obtained that seem to deviate from what would appear to be individually rational. So in these instances, the, the evidence is re-examined. What is the evidence telling us? Or the theory is revised. <clears throat> but in almost all cases, the revisions never drop the maximising hypothesis, never drop the maximising assumption. But that is our basic building block, that we assume people are trying to make something as big as possible. In other social sciences, they might try to explain, understand, analyse preferences, really get to the heart of why somebody is making a particular decision because of a set of preferences. What makes them do it? In economics, we generally take the preferences as given and just assume that people are making themselves as well off as possible. So the emphasis on maximisation allows the analyst to make predictions in new situations. So if we know what the person is trying to do, 
And if we no see that the situation changes, well, then we can see how they can respond. So if the incentives change, what will be the impact on the decision? So place a levy on plastic bags. People will use less plastic bags. Place a subsidy in the construction of student accommodation near third level institutes. And you get springing up of um, building supply and accommodation to third level students. So make something more expensive, more of it will happen, or less of it will happen. Make something less expensive and more of it will happen. And why is that? Well, the consumer wants to spend their 12 cent on something else. A plastic bag doesn't confer 12, 25, or now it would be up to 45 cent of benefit for the consumer. They can spend that money better elsewhere. So they will choose not to spend the money in the plastic bag and spend it elsewhere. When it comes to construction of student accommodation, investors are looking to earn a profit. The addition of a subsidy increases the profits that can be earned, makes it more likely that people will invest in that area. So in, hence the investment increases. So by taking our rationality assumption, saying people are maximizing, then say, what are they maximizing? Then look at how their situation changes. We can make predictions about how the changes will uh, pan out. And these predictions form the testable hypothesis. Why did the government introduce a plastic bag levy? It was to reduce consumption. So we can look at what was the situation before the levy, the situation after the levy, and then test the hypothesis. What did economics say would happen? It said people would use less plastic bags. Do they use less plastic bags? Yes, it fell by 95%. So the theory fits the evidence, so our rationality hypothesis in that instance worked. The same with the construction of uh, student accommodation. We'll make it cheaper, people should supply more. Did they supply more? Yes, so the theory, the evidence fits in. So in some instances, people have uh, found situations where people appear to act in an irrational manner. And that is becoming a growing area of study in economics. That this rationality assumption, rationality hypothesis, is no longer taken to hold in 100% of cases. That in fact, there are situations when people will act in an inconsistent manner. And you can read across a whole range of areas of irrational behaviour. Sometimes it's down to how the information is presented whether it's presented in a positive or a negative fashion. Sometimes it's down to the people being uh, themselves rational. They know what they're doing uh, isn't in their own best interests, and they must get a particular nudge to move in one direction or the other. So a lot of times we know what we should do. So as students, you shouldn't leave studying until the week before the exam. I can come back in the end of April and ask that question again and see how many started studying this week. You know perhaps that to get the best results you should start now, um, but something else takes over, the immediate and the important, and a different emphasis on what individuals want to do. <coughs> so that's the rationality hypothesis. It's sort of a basic building block. Other social sciences don't assume that. Other social sciences try to understand the preferences. In general, we don't really dig down into the preferences. We largely take them as given. People do what they want to do. Whatever it is, we're not too concerned or make judgments about it are looking back deep into their inner psyche to see where their preferences were formed. We just assume that they're trying to make themselves as well off as possible. The second concept we look at is equilibrium. Try to find steady states. Make comparisons between different situations. That if a change occurs, what was the equilibrium before the change? What's the equilibrium after the change? And then try to make a comparison between those two states of nature. So economic theory usually consists in modelling the behaviour of agents, whether they're individuals, households, firms, uh, public um, services, etc. They were just modelling their behaviour. So then the behaviour of individual actors is aggregated to examine what happens when they interact. And in the greater majority of cases, this takes place in markets. Somebody is trying to buy a particular good or service, and somebody is trying to sell it. So what happens when these people interact? So it can be in, and is in the greater majority of cases, in money terms. So what happens when a certain number of people want to buy a particular product? What happens when a certain number of people want to supply it? How do they come together? And then what happens maybe if there's government interference in the middle? The government wants to maybe help buyers 
through the creation of consumer law or wants to change the price with the addition of taxes can we model and say pick out the impact of each of those so to do this we use equilibrium what would happen in the previous state of nature what's happened in the current state of nature and make comparison what was the impact of the change was there a change of behavior in one party or the other is somebody else now better off or worse off <clears throat> so it, it is the interest in equilibrium that again distinguishes economics from other social sciences <clears throat> again they may look at aggregate situations but it's not so much from the same perspective that uh, economists look at it and our most famous model of equilibrium is of course the model of supply and demand draw a downward sloping demand curve and upward sloping supply curve and see where they cross and the market will tend towards that equilibrium if there are some forces that move it away from the equilibrium the market will tend towards it if there's excess demand prices will rise and firms will supply more if there's excess supply prices will fall firms will supply less and consumers will demand more so the market will tend to equilibrium whether that is a very short run adjustment or a very long run adjustment can differ depending on the markets some markets can respond almost instantaneously to news so in financial markets if there's a release from a company if there's a, an earnings uh, forecast if there's news about, about a particular company the stock market will price that in immediately the price will move from whatever the original level was to the new level in a matter of seconds it won't take days or weeks or months for the market to adjust, adjust it will have done so straight away almost instantaneous reaction <laughs> in other cases markets might take much more longer to adjust so for example say in the market for for oil for petrol if there's an oil price shock that caused the price of oil to double up to 200 dollars a barrel people will want obviously want to use and purchase less of it the price of it has gone up but in the very short term there's probably very little they can do if their home is based on solid fuel heating they might be able to change it slightly but their demand will remain largely the same if they drive a car to work or to other events again unless they don't go to the event or don't go to work their demand for petrol will remain largely the same so in the short term there's unlikely to be immediate adjustments but over a longer period 6 12 18 months people couldn't change their homes from solid fuel to gas or other sources of energy they could change their car from being a 1.8 or a 2 litre to a much smaller car and the market might actually take two three four years until it reaches its new equilibrium and again we can make the comparison of what has happened from the initial stage to the final stage but it mightn't happen in a very short period so in a stock market it can be done in a second the news breaks the prices change almost instantaneously in other markets it can take years for the new equilibrium um, to come about but again we can compare what the situation was in the initial and in the post situation <clears throat> the final concept that distinguishes economics is the notion of efficiency and this entails welfare being maximized so again as economists we assume that individuals and firms are maximizing <clears throat> but actually in our analysis as economists we also look to see can things be made better off have we reached the best equilibrium has welfare been maximized so as we said right back at the first class we had when we looked at basic principles of economics trade works and the reason trade works is because it creates a surplus goods move from people who value them lower to people who value them higher so our example was a buyer willing to pay six thousand for some good and a seller willing to receive or sorry a buyer willing to pay eight thousand and a seller willing to receive six thousand if that trade occurs two thousand euro of surplus or welfare is created it doesn't matter what price the trade occurs at we know the trade will only be occur between six and eight the seller will not sell for below six and the buyer will not buy for above eight so the trade will occur in that range regardless of the price two thousand euro of benefit will be created the price determines the distribution of it so if you're interested in equity you might want to favor buyers over sellers but as long as the trade occurs 
the surplus is created, whether it goes to the seller in the form of an excess profit over what they were willing to accept, so they might get seven, seven and a half, eight thousand when they were willing to accept six, or whether it goes to the consumer in the form of a consumer surplus, willing to pay eight thousand for this product, but actually got it for six and a half. There's a 1,500 euro surplus there for the consumer. The benefit they get, they value at eight. The price they paid, six and a half. So regardless of the price, the welfare increases when goods move from those who value them lower to those who value them higher. What we look at with efficiency is total welfare maximized. All these welfare generating trades, have all of them occurred that could occur? So an economist model a situation and the resulting equilibrium is described as inefficient, usually there are trades that could have occurred that are implicitly or explicitly ruled out. So there's something that happened that essentially caused a breakdown in trades, whether it's power on one side of the market or the other, whether it was asymmetric information, or whether it was the concept of externalities. Maybe the price isn't picking up the full costs and benefits. So in this instance, the market could be deemed uh, inefficient one of our simplest examples of inefficiency is a monopoly. Like what is a monopolist trying to do? As a firm is trying to earn as much profit as possible. But because a monopolist has market power, excuse me, the monopolist has the ability to set the price. The monopolist doesn't take the price as given. They're not operating in a competitive market. They're not price takers. So the monopolist can take, set the price. And what generally happens in a mon monopoly is the price is set higher than it would be under competition. So in this instance, because the price is higher, the quantity demanded or the quantity purchased is lower. So while society would be better off if extra trades occur, the monopolist wouldn't be better off. The monopolist gets to the profit maximizing position, which is a lower quantity at a higher price. Whereas what society would prefer is a higher quantity at a lower price. And if the market was competitive, they would drive the price down. Those trades would occur. So when looking at market situations, we can work out the loss as a result of a monopoly. How many trades didn't occur because that firm had market power? And across most areas, governments take steps to reduce market power. So in Ireland, we have the body called the Competition Authority. And they review and view and analyse markets and see is there excessive market power? <laughs> is there situations where welfare isn't being maximized? In most cases, it works in favor of the consumer. The power tends to be with the, the seller. Uh, there are some instances where the power um, <coughs> is with the buyer, but they tend to be rare. In labor markets, through trade unions, again, some of the power can be uh, through the supplier through the workers, acting as a collective. So again, the, the trade unions, in some instances, can limit trades occurring. Just like a monopolist wants to keep the price of their output up, trade unions want to keep the price of their supply up, the supply of existing labor. So trade unions work well for those who have a job. Trade unions don't, don't work so well for those who don't have a job. Trade unions are out to support uh, members, i.e. those who have employment. So they will be uh, uh, opposed to any wage reductions, which makes rational sense, given the, the audience there um, and those who are paying the dues into the, the, the trade union. But it might be that if the price was reduced, just like in a monopoly, welfare could be increased. But again, just like the monopoly doesn't want to give up market power because it'll reduce its profit, the trade union doesn't want to give up power. So the power of economics in general lies in its rigour that we can actually undertake these forms of analysis, that we can put numbers on these and say whether particular situations are best. Have we reached the optimum outcome? Could we make people better off? <laughs> so economics is scientific. So it follows a scientific method of stating a refutable theory. This is our starting point. Testing the theory and revising the theory based on evidence. So if you go out into the real world and find evidence that refutes the theory, well, there's two things you must do. Well, first, you must clearly check the evidence. 
Have you collected the evidence in a, an accurate manner? And then if the evidence does stack up and it refutes the theory, then you must go back to the start. So how then can we look at economics maybe being extended into areas that wouldn't traditionally be in the remit of economics? So we look at the work primarily of Gary Becker, a Nobel Prize winner in economics. And much of what he has done has been to extend the remit of economics into areas that traditionally weren't associated with economics. So rather than just looking at supply and demand, goods and services, firms, market structures, Gary Becker took the words of Alfred Marshall and said, economics is people in their everyday life, the ordinary business of life. So we looked at different situations and said, well, what are people doing? What choices, decisions are they taking? <clears throat> so here we apply the three principles that Lazier has outlined. What makes economics different? Rationality, equilibrium, efficiency. Becker took those, looked at the world around him and said, how can I apply the tools of economics to areas not under the traditional remit of economics? <clears throat> so Gary Becker has done the most to expand the boundaries of economics into other social sciences. So it might have been the remit of psychologists or sociologists or philosophers. He said they have one particular set of tools of analysing these problems. Maybe the economist has something to offer. <clears throat> so the first area we look at is the work Becker has done in modelling tastes. So up to now we've largely said that as economists we take preferences as given. The people just have different preferences. People want different things. And from our perspective, this might essentially assume that uh, people are different, that there's differences in the way people uh, look at the world and differences in the way they demand goods and services. Uh, however, rather than trying to describe taste directly, so a psychologist might try to understand why a person wants a particular good or service. Uh, what Becker did was instead of looking at consumption as being using goods, he looked at it as production, generating utility. So it wasn't so much about the using of the goods, which was the traditional economic view of the household. But the household was something that consumed goods. Becker said, flip it around. And don't say a household is something that uses goods. Say a household is something that produces utility. So what does the individual do? So Becker recast consumption as production so that changes in prices and income could be the driving forces to understanding behaviour. So rather than um, looking at the goods as being part of the consumption, he looked at goods and time as being part of production. How much utility can a household produce? Well, it depends on what goods they buy and how much time they have to use them. How much utility can they get from those goods? So now rather than looking at utility as being the end point where you have the goods and look at how you get there, he looked at utility as being the starting point. They want to make utility and they do so using goods and time. So Becker viewed goods as inputs into an individual's production function. And he assumed people now are producing utility. Whatever it might be, enjoyment, well-being, satisfaction. Again, it doesn't really matter how you define it. But the simple word we use is utility. <laughs> so what entered the utility function were the commodities, goods and services that could be produced by some combination of goods and time. <laughs> so when he said for some individuals, time-intensive commodities are more or less expensive. If you're a high-wage earner, giving up your time costs money. If you're a lawyer who can bill at 200 euros an hour, a doctor who can see patients at 50 euro every 10 minutes, giving up an hour of your time is quite expensive. So the more time you give up to produce utility, the greater the cost, because you're giving up more in terms of lost earnings. So time-intensive commodities are more expensive to high-wage individuals than are goods-intensive commodities. Goods-intensive commodities might cost more money but if you're a high-wage person, you have more money. What you don't want to give up is your time. 
time is the biggest expense. That if you're earning 200 grand a year, taking a day off work is quite expensive. But if you're earning 200 grand a year, buying something for 1,000 euro mightn't be relatively that expensive. <coughs> so what Becker did with this, I said, is there a difference between high wage and low wage people? If you look at how they enjoy their leisure, there appears to be huge differences between them. What sort of leisure activities do they engage in? Is it because rich people are, in a sense, snobs, and poor people are, in a sense, slobs, that they have different leisure preferences? Or is it because they face different circumstances? Are they actually making rational choices? <clears throat> so what Becker said is high-wage people enjoy their leisure in different ways to low-wage people. Not in a sense because they have different preferences, but because they have different circumstances. So high-wage people may spend fewer hours in leisure activities. So they don't want to give up time. Time is their valuable commodity. <laughs> but these involve high-priced goods, such as opera tickets, expensive restaurant meals, and yachting. They're looking for goods-intensive leisure activities. To in a try and sense counter for the fact that they're trying to squeeze a lot into a limited time. So the amount of money spent can be quite high, but they try and condense the time. Whereas low wage people, the cost of time is much lower. That if you're earning 865 an hour, giving up a day's work isn't a huge cost. 100, 120 euro. <clears throat> but in these instances, the amount of money they have to spend on leisure activities is far lower. So while the cost of time is lower, the cost of goods is higher. So low-wage people combine their time with relatively low-cost inputs. So spending a higher fraction of their time playing football, watching television, etc. Activities which are low-cost in terms of goods, practically free, but do take a lot, amount, a lot of time. So much more dispersed and spread out. <clears throat> so Becker essentially said that people are the same. They have the same sets of preferences. It's not so much that rich people are different to poor people. It's just that they face different conditions. That for rich people, they want to condense their leisure time and have it very goods intensive. For poor people, it costs them less to stretch it out. So it'll be very time intensive. And again, this is a testable hypothesis. And again, evidence has shown that if somebody moves from being poor to being rich, their leisure activities change. It's the same person. We assume that they're making the same choices, but the circumstances they're in are different. So what Becker said, it's not so much trying to explain differences between poor people and rich people. It's the circumstances they're in that lead to the decisions. The fact that one is looking for very goods-intensive, low-time leisure, whereas the other is looking for very, say, low goods-intensive, but much more longer-duration leisure activities. So you essentially say that people are the same, but operate in different circumstances. Whereas from a psychologist or a sociologist perspective, it might be trying to find differences between these groups. Why do they engage in different leisure activities? But Becker simply said it's, and from an economist's perspective, we assume people are rational. They want to maximise utility. How does a high earner maximise their utility? Limit the time they spend on leisure. Because the more time they spend on leisure, the less time they spend working. How does a low-wage person maximise their utility? Well, for leisure, they have less money to spend. But they have greater time. So devote more time to leisure activities than a rich person. So it ties in with what an economist would view as maximising behaviour. So again, it's not that rich people are rational to go to the opera, or poor people are rational, or irrational even, sit down watching sport all day on a Saturday on television. It's just that they're in different circumstances. Both are maximising, given the conditions they face. A second area where Becker extended the work of economics was into demography, looking at population. Again, this would primarily be the, the focus of geographers and sociologists. <clears throat> but Becker said we can apply the tools of economics 
to demography, population growth. So back at the start of the 1800s, Thomas Malthus was the first economist to model population growth. <clears throat> and what did his work result in economics being dubbed as? A name that still classifies. Yeah, close enough, the dismal science. Malthus looked at population growth and he said because of the way populations uh, grow, they grow exponentially or geometrically, I think was the correct phrase that Malthus used. That 2 becomes 4, 4 becomes 8, 8 becomes 16, 16 becomes 32. That populations double. He modelled that as being population growth. And Malthus then looked at food production. And he said food production will grow arithmetically. 2 becomes 4, 4 becomes 6, 6 becomes 8. So even after 4 iterations, there's a huge gap between the number of people to be fed and the amount of food uh, that's available to feed them. So Malthus predicted <coughs> rampant famine every couple of generations to serve as population checks that food production simply could not sustain population growth. And he said millions would die in cycles <coughs> because of uh, this problem. <coughs> so his theory of population growth uh, wasn't very cheery. So hence, economics became dubbed the dismal science as it turns out, Malthus's um, theory didn't stack up to reality. Around this time, the Industrial Revolution was taking place. And in fact, food production didn't grow arithmetically. The advance in steam power and then the advance in the internal combustion engine, advances in chemicals, fertilizers, have all meant that food production has kept pace largely with population growth. So back in his time in the 1800s, the population of the planet was less than 1 billion. Just 200 years later, the population of the planet is hurtling towards 7 billion. And while there might be areas of drought and starvation in the world, the world actually produces enough food to feed 7 billion people. And food production will continue to expand. So Malthus's theory didn't stack up to reality. So his um, theory was thrown out and he himself uh, later in life did concede that his population growth theory didn't stack up. Um, Becker also looked at population growth and he looked at the decision to have children. Why do different countries have different rates of population growth? Why do different countries have different rates of fertility? Number of babies born per woman. Why does it range hugely from less than two in some countries which isn't, isn't enough to uh, maintain the population at existing levels, to 12, 13, or 14 in other countries. And in fact, in Ireland, we offer a huge experiment in demography and fertility. There's been a huge drop in fertility rates in Ireland over a period of 50 or 60 years. Like up to 30, 40, 50 years ago, families of 10 plus children were not that unusual. Anyone here from a family of 10 plus children? One. If I asked the same question 50 years ago, the likelihood is three quarters of more would have been in a family of 10 plus children. So not only do we have differences across countries, we have differences through time. So what has happened in Ireland? Why has the fertility rate dropped by such a large amount? We are going through a baby boom at the moment. There's more births in Ireland than ever before. But this is not because women are having more children. It's simply because we have more children to have babies. A much younger population in the child... Um, whatever the word would be. Child giving, child birthing, child making age, whatever it might be. So rather than an increase in fertility, it's simply down to the numbers of women um, of that age. So Becker said, why does fertility rates change? So he said, well, look at the decision to have a child is a decision. We assume people are rational, people are maximizing. Let's look at the factors that underline the decision to have a child. <clears throat> so in one of his more controversial works, he compared having a child to buying a dishwasher. Well, he didn't really say a dishwasher, but it's essentially what he said. He modeled the choice to have children as demand for a consumer durable, something that produces a stream of services. 
So buy a dishwasher, it cleans your dishes for five, seven, ten years. Have a child, you get enjoyment, or apparently enjoyment, over a period of 10, 20, 30 years. <clears throat> so he said, what are the issues involved in uh, the decision to have children? So like with his leisure preferences approach, he also used time. So the allocation of time is useful in predicting differences in fertility. What have you to give up or do to get these services? What is the cost of having a child? If females are low or no wage, the cost of being pregnant, the cost of child rearing is quite low. If they're staying in the, ho in the home, if they're not earning an income, well then having a child and being pregnant doesn't really cost too much. Whereas if women are in the workplace, are in labour force participation, are earning a wage, well then the decision to have children can have costs, i.e. you must give up that wage. So high wage women are less likely to have children than low wage women, simply because of the costs involved. Assume we want to make ourselves as well off as possible. Okay, a child provides a stream of services, that's a benefit to having a child, where are the costs on the other side? So if the women are in the labour force, the cost can be measured in terms of time. So since child services is a time intensive commodity, actually getting the benefits, high wage women face a higher price of children than do low wage women, which would be do rather than so. So the policy implications are profound. To reduce fer fertility, it's important to raise the wage rate of women and improve their labour market alternatives. So the theory suggests that when women have greater labour market opportunities and higher wages, fertility drops. In Ireland, fertility has fallen hugely in the last 50 years. If you look at labour market participation of females, it has soared. If you look at average incomes of females, they have risen. The evidence supports the theory. Now, why has fertility rates dropped in Ireland? Because women can have two, maybe three children without giving up their job without suffering in the labour market. But if you go four, five, six, seven children, the woman is unlikely to keep working. So the decision becomes, if you keep having children, there's an additional cost. There could be other sources at play in Ireland, of course. We are, uh, uh, or were up to 30 or 40 years ago, a hugely Catholic production, or Catholic country production. <laughs> <laughs> Catholicism leads to production of babies. And we leave it as no more than that. But in terms of global issues, there are some countries that where the fertility rate is simply too high. That if we talk about food, if we look at the areas that have food shortages, these are the countries that tend to have the highest fertility. Again, because the cost of children having the children are low and the benefits are positive. So any benefit above zero will lead people to have more children. So somebody, whether to go out and work, to scavenge, to earn, whatever it might be, to provide services, to uh, work on the farm. These are what they view the, ch the child as having. And plus, if child mortality is quite high, if a, a certain proportion of them will die before the age of five, again, it will encourage um, further fertility. So one way of addressing this, if it is a problem, is to raise the labour market opportunities of women, to get a balance between the costs and the benefits. <laughs> the last issue we look at, and Becker looked at, a whole range of issues across his career, is the concept of discrimination. Again, discrimination would be a huge area in other social sciences, where a person or a group of people openly or actively discriminate against another group. So whether it's gender discrimination, age discrimination, race discrimination, whatever it might be. Again, there have been a whole host of studies to try and explain this behaviour. And Becker said, could discrimination be considered a rational action? And he looked at it as, again, something that would feed into a person's utility function. That he said, it's something people want to do. And this might be completely opposite the way the approach would be taken in other social sciences. So as a result, Becker said, discrimination could be analysed in the same way that demand for other goods could be understood. That if there's a particular price for it, whether it's paying men more, paying whites more, <coughs> paying younger people more, paying women less, paying blacks less, paying older people less, that somebody was incurring a cost. 
that if there are two people available for a particular job and somebody chooses the higher cost individual well they're obviously willing to pay the higher cost <clears throat> so the taste might reflect the utility function that most would regard as objectionable sinister evil but the behavior ties in with rationalizing maximizing behavior so somebody is willing to pay a price to satisfy their preferences somebody is thirsty they're willing to pay and go out and buy a can of coke somebody wants to discriminate they're willing to pay higher wages to somebody else <clears throat> so in the labor market this implies that an employer who did not like blacks would be willing to pay a higher wage to white workers of equal ability so rather than trying to explain understand analyze discrimination look at how it ties in with maximizing behavior so that's all from Ed Lazier that reading is up on Blackboard the Blackboard site is active you'll get the slides and get the readings and you can go through that so we'll be back for today I'll take it up with strategic behavior on 